So as we all hoped, JWST has been giving us results that seem to contradict our best theory of how the universe works. Now, us scientists love it when something like this happens because we learn something new. And the big sort of latest mystery that everyone's been puzzling over is the fact that in JWST data, we found galaxies that are too big. They seem to have formed too many stars in too short of a time, quicker than what our best model of the universe says is possible. Now, you might have seen some people online and in the media making claims that this means that the Big Bang never happened, which is just plain wrong. The Big Bang theory describes the past 13.8 billion years of the universe's entire evolution. So making a statement like the Big Bang never happened just doesn't even make any sense. What this result from JWST does mean is that there might be a problem, or tension is, is the word that scientists like to use to describe this, with our best model of the universe, Lambda CDM. So Lambda here meaning that the universe is accelerating, expanding. And CDM stands for cold, dark matter. I.e. there's dark matter in the universe. We need it there to make all our observations make sense, and its cold are not hot. Now, what that means that lambda CDM actually is, is, you know, it's this. It's the ratio of all of the stuff in the universe and how much of the universe's energy budget went to each of them. But it's also this, the Hubble diagram showing that the universe is accelerating, expanding. But it's also this as well, huge big cosmological simulations of the entire universe showing how galaxies first formed and evolved. So it gives us things like, you know, a ratio of how much normal matter to dark matter there is in the universe. And then that tells us, okay, well, when matter was first clumping together under gravity to come together to form the first stars and galaxies, how quickly could that happen? How quick could it clump together? How did it clump together? And so therefore there was some maximum density that you could actually have material at a certain point in the universe's history. And so there was a maximum rate at which you could form stars. Now, JWST allows us to see these processes happening for the first time, to observe the first stars and galaxies. It's sort of a time machine, and that cheese line gets thrown around a lot, but it's essentially true, right? Because light takes time to travel to us, when we actually look at more and more distant galaxies, we're seeing them as they were in the very early universe. As we look further back in distance, we're looking further back in time as well. And this is how we are able to piece together this puzzle. We can really only do this with JWST because the universe is expanding. So light that's given out invisible wavelengths that we could see with our eyes and the lights of the Hubble Space Telescope is stretched so much by the expansion of space to longer and longer wavelengths into the infrared that it's beyond like the wavelength range that the Hubble Space Telescope can pick up and this is why we need JWST. So one of the main goals for astronomers with JWST was to find the most distant galaxies they could and work out their properties. Now to do this, essentially in images, you look for the smallest, reddest objects that you can find. And so once you've found them, what you then do is fit models to the light that you record for these galaxies, and those models can hopefully tell you something about the properties. So you can do this in one of two ways. Either you can take a spectra of a galaxy, that's ideally what you would do. So this is where you take the light from a galaxy, split it through a prism, and you get a trace of how much light at every single wavelength do you receive. Now that's a lot more complex than just taking images of something where you only let light through at certain wavelengths through a filter. And so you can see how the two compare with the filters you essentially just get like the total brightness at this wavelength range. But you miss a lot of the detail that gives you a lot more information. Then you're gonna make a model essentially to say, okay, can I recreate this amount of light that I'm getting uh, in these filters? Or can I recreate this trace of light in the spectrum? And from those models, you can again usually get out two main things. One is the redshift and one is the stellar mass, the amount of mass you have in stars. Now I've talked in videos before about how you actually get redshift from these observations, which I'll link below if you're curious and wanna know more. But here in this video, I just wanna focus on how we estimate stellar mass from these observations with these fits. So if you think it through, right, the brighter a galaxy is, the more stars there are giving out that light. 
and the more stars there are, the heavier a galaxy is, so the higher the stellar mass. Except it's not that simple because you also need to know the amount of the different types of stars that you have in a galaxy. Because more massive stars are brighter and give off more light than less massive stars, which are much fainter. So if you're trying to account for like a given amount, like a total amount of light from a galaxy, you could either say, okay, this light is coming from just a handful of very massive stars, or you could attribute it to a huge amount of lower mass stars, which cumulatively actually end up being heavier than just the few brighter, higher mass stars. The problem is we don't know how many of all of the different types of stars at different masses you actually tend to form in a very distant galaxy in the early universe. That is not something that we can directly observe. We can do it though for things much more nearby. So for example, in our own galaxy in the Milky Way, we can actually see and count the individual different stars and find what's called the initial mass function. A distribution showing the spread of stars of different masses made in star formation episodes across our own galaxy. So essentially the number of lower mass stars formed compared to the number of higher mass stars formed. And what's cool is that when we look at other galaxies nearby to us and look at, you know, how many stars of each different types of mass they form in these star formation episodes, we find that these distributions are pretty similar. They're very consistent with each other. So if you observe a galaxy and you say, okay, I know how bright this galaxy is. And if I assume that it's forming the sort of same spread of the different types and masses of stars that I see in the Milky Way, and you know how much light all of those different types of stars give off, then you can say, okay, I know how many stars must be in this galaxy. Therefore I can work out its stellar mass. The problem is to do that, you've made a really big assumption there. You've assumed that the spread of stars, this IMF, the initial mass function, is going to be the same in that galaxy as in the Milky Way. We call this assumption a universal initial mass function, i.e. the IMF is the same wherever you are in the universe. It is universal. But of course, in reality, it's probably not going to be the case. You're going to have some variation in it. Like for example, you could have more of the smaller stars being formed, in which case we'd call that a bottom heavy IMF. Or conversely, you could be forming less of the smaller stars, in which case you'd call that a bottom light IMF. Or you could be forming more of the heavier, larger stars, in which case that would be a top heavy IMF. And then also, you know, if you're forming less of the larger stars, it's a top light IMF. Now there has been a lot of research in the past couple of decades trying to figure out if the initial mass function is truly universal or not, or if there is some variation beyond randomness in different galaxies' IMFs. And while we're pretty sure now that galaxies clearly do have different IMFs, there isn't a consensus yet on what we still should do and assume for different galaxies. So the safe bet is still this assumption of a universal IMF, which is what a lot of codes or software packages that are written by astronomers and released for, you know, their fellow astronomers to use to do these fits to observations of galaxies and get out stellar masses. It's what a lot of those codes still assume, a universal initial mass function that's the same as the one that we observe in the Milky Way. That's exactly what Labbe and collaborators did in their recent paper announcing the discovery of these very distant galaxies in the early universe, and in it calculated their masses to be far larger than we ever would have expected, but did so using this universal IMF, assuming it was the same as the Milky Way for these very distant galaxies in the early universe. Boylan and Colchin then actually investigated these galaxies further, finding that the most massive ones were in tension with Lambda C. EDM. They are right on the edge of what is physically possible for these galaxies. You know, as we heard before, right, Lambda CDM, given all the properties of the universe that we've measured, tells us that there's only so quickly you can actually clump material together in the early universe. So 
at a given age in the universe's history, there'll be this maximum density of normal matter, sometimes called baryons in a galaxy, which in turn limits the density of stars that can form from that material. So this blue region of the plot here is the part that's just physically impossible. You'd have more stars than there is sort of normal matter available for them to form from. And those galaxies that Labe and collaborators found at about a redshift of nine, they're right on the edge of what shouldn't be possible. Hence the statement that they're too big for our best model of the universe. So yeah, these results suggest that there could be something wrong with Lambda CDM, which wouldn't surprise me. There's a lot of things wrong in cosmology at the minute. And a lot of that I've talked about on my channel before. Again, I'll link some videos in the description if you're interested in a deeper dive into that. And it could be that, yeah, we're missing some component of the universe or we've measured something incorrectly that would change maybe the speed at which material was able to clump together in the early universe. And that would solve this. And there's a lot of ideas sort of knocking around the astronomy community at the minute to come up with ways that perhaps, you know, this is why it's in tension with Lambda CDM. And I talked about this on my channel a few months ago when we first covered the fact that these galaxies have been found in JWST data. And I went through like all the possibilities for what could explain why their masses were so big, like what could be wrong in terms of our assumptions. But as you might have figured out already, one way to resolve this might not be anything to do with Lambda CDM at all. It's this assumption of a universal IMF, the same IMF that you get in the Milky Way as you get in the very early universe that is completely different to the universe that we see around us today, turns out that assumption is probably a bad one. This is exactly what Steinhardt and collaborators have investigated. So building on their work from you know the past few years, looking at this assumption of a universal IMF and if it's any good. It turns out if you actually look at the temperature of the star forming regions, if the gas that's going to form those stars is actually hotter, then you end up with a bottom light IMF, producing less of the smaller stars. Now, the early universe, as we know, was a hotter, denser place than it is today. So it's very likely that the star formation regions were also hotter, and so there was a bottom light IMF in the early universe. The other thing to consider is the cosmic microwave background, this relic of radiation that we get from the very early universe. Today, when we detect it, it's microwave wavelengths of light with a very cold temperature of only around 2.7 Kelvin. But that's because it's been redshifted by the expansion of the universe, these lower energy wavelengths. When it was first given out, it was at much higher energy wavelengths and it was much hotter. So at redshifts of like 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, these redshifts that now the JWST is actually pushing us out to, the cosmic microwave background is still anywhere from let's say 40 to 60 Kelvin in temperature. And so that kind of puts a limit on, well, the gas that's going to be forming your stars is also probably going to be around that temperature as well. So what Steinhardt and collaborators did was take the galaxies that Labe and collaborators had found and refit them with a model that allowed the IMF to vary. They find that when they do this, the inferred stellar masses drop because the IMF that they fit is bottom light at these higher redshifts. There are less of these lower mass stars that in big numbers actually do add up and give you more mass. It's actually a really big effect. The mass drop is sometimes, you know, over an order of magnitudes. So what I mean by that is that these are logarithmic numbers. So the actual sort of mass value is 10 to the power of the number given here in this table. So a difference between nine and 7.79 means there's over a 10 times difference in the stellar mass. And they once again looked at this baryon availability problem that Boylan Colchin first looked at and found there was no longer an issue. There was no longer any tension with Lambda CDM now that you've brought down this estimate of the mass of these galaxies at very high redshifts very early in the universe. Essentially, they're not as big as we first thought. The more accurate measurement of the mass has meant that the problem has just gone away. Which is kind of sad because we haven't learned anything new about Lambda CDM, but we have, I guess, learned something about 
the IMF. And to be honest, I wasn't surprised by this result. I was kind of like, yeah, that checks out. Because for a long time, we've known that this assumption of a universal IMF is probably not a good one, especially at high redshift in the very early universe when conditions were very, very different. So on the one hand, I'm like, yeah, makes total sense. On the other hand, I still have this sort of, you know, healthy dose of scientific skepticism over this because you could argue that what you've done is just added an extra parameter to your model, so giving it more flexibility, more degrees of freedom, and so aren't you just overfitting the data now? Now the authors do address this concern themselves in the research paper and so suggest this two-pronged approach to combat this. And so what you do, once you've gone through all your images and found your candidate galaxies that you think are going to be at high redshift, the first fit you do is just with the standard normal assumption of a universal IMF, the same as the Milky Way. And you do that fit and you get a redshift out to start with. And then once you have that redshift, you can be like, okay, well, the cosmic microwave background at that redshift is going to be this temperature. So that sets a limit on the temperature of my star forming regions that are going to be making stars. And so it gives me an IMF straight out. So higher temperature, you'll have a more bottom light IMF. Now you've then set your IMF in your next fit as a different one. And you do the fit again to get out a redshift once more and a much more accurate estimate of the stellar mass of the galaxy. That's what they're advising people to do in the future as they're getting their data from JWST, which I think is a sensible way to go about it, just to be aware that if you're trying to get at mass, like you can't just assume everything's going to be the same as the Milky Way. Now, as always with this early JWST science that we've been seeing so much of for the past year, this has just been done with images that the science teams could get their hands on very quickly. What you'd ideally want to do though, to do these fits much more accurately is to get spectra, where you take the light, split it through a prism and get that trace of how much light of each wavelength you detect that's so much more detailed. So as always, I feel like a broken record, but we need more data and there are actually follow-up observations that are going to happen or maybe even already happened as well with JWST where they're going to get spectra for these high redshift candidates that have been found in images. And with that data, you know, it's going to be so much more detailed. We're going to be able to tell a lot more about the properties of these populations of stars in the very early universe as well, like what they're made of. That'll help inform the sort of models we're fitting much better help constrain them a lot more and then that'll hopefully tell us you know what is the initial mass function of galaxies in the very early universe. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to say a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this week's video. Brilliant.org is one of the best ways to learn science and maths interactively with thousands of lessons from foundational and advanced maths to AI to data science to neural networks and much more with new lessons added every single month. If after watching this video, you want to learn more about cosmology, so that study of the evolution of the entire universe, then check out this section of their fantastic astrophysics course, which covers the basics of cosmological principles, but also goes into a deeper dive on the temperature of the cosmic microwave background that we touched on in this video. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description down below. And the first 200 of you that go to that link are going to get 20% off an annual subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. I'm trying very hard not to angry cry right now because I just filmed this whole video and it recorded without sound. I don't know why. I think my mic wasn't just quite plugged in right and it's just <sighs> Friday afternoon. I just want to be done. <laughs> Our best model of the universe, Lambda Shedium. It's Shedi. U I N F U I M F U I N F. Stars of different types and masses in its star formation episodes as the Milky Way. Very rude pip of a horn outside then. I am in the middle of science. Yeah, that checks out because for a long time we've known this assumption of a univi universal universe. Like me, that sounds like goofy. 